The last month, there was a news that shocked the food and health industry and generated much debate. On July 14, 2023, the WHO International Agency for Research on Cancer declared that aspartame, a very common sugar substitute used in many food and beverages, is possibly carcinogenic to human. Now, certainly, this bombshell news and wordings like possibly immediately spark debate among different health-related authorities. And with debatable news like this, Elon Musk had to express his view, right? Basically, he'd be dead if aspartame causes cancer. Now, our beloved FDA immediately responded with a disagreement with the International Agency for Research on Cancer's conclusion, but they also said that they would continue to monitor the latest science available on the topic. Now, so with all the debate on the internet, who should we believe? What's the evidence and why aspartame and other sweeteners or sugar substitute have created so much debate? Now, this week is going to be different, and let's have a story to find out what has happened with sweeteners since a century ago. In 1879, Constant Thalberg, a Russian chemist, was working in the laboratory of Ira Remsen at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Thalberg was conducting research on coal tar derivatives, which were being studied for their potential applications in the dye and pharmaceutical. One day after his long day in his laboratory with his colleague, he went home so tired and hungry. He couldn't wait until his wife finished prepping the dinner, so he grabbed a piece of bread and took a bite before dinner was ready. But he tasted something strange. Normally, Russian rye bread would have little to no specific taste, but it was especially sweet with that bite. He then took a second bite, but it wasn't as sweet anymore. He paused, and a light bulb went off. He quickly went back to his lab and licked all his experiment apparatus, and he struck gold. Even though Felberg and his colleague were not successful in isolating useful pharmaceutical compounds from coal tar, he isolated some white crystals after working long hours in the lab, and without washing his hands, went to eat dinner. He noticed that the bread he ate tasted unusually sweet. He quickly realized that the sweetness was coming from his hands, which had come into contact with the chemicals he had been working with. Now, intrigued by his unexpected discovery, Felber continued his experiments and eventually isolated the compound responsible for the sweetness, which he named saccharin. So, as a fellow scientist, I have to say he was very reckless as a chemist. Not only did he not wear gloves while working with chemicals, he also didn't wash his hands before he left the lab and before dinner. And the licking experiment apparatus was probably the worst of all. But his reckless lab practice made a scientific breakthrough, nevertheless. Saccharin is estimated to be approximately 300 to 400 times sweeter than sucrose or table sugar. Now that means that only a very small amount of saccharin is needed to achieve the same level of sweetness as a larger quantity of sugar. The story goes that Felberg and Remsen filed a patent for saccharin in 1884 relationship becomes strained over issues related to the patent and credit for the discovery. Remsen argued that Felbert had used the laboratory's resources and his guidance to make the discovery, and therefore should share the credit. Felbert, on the other hand, believed that he deserved sole credit for the discovery. The patent for saccharin was eventually granted in 1885. Felberg moved to New York and established a saccharin manufacturing company, which became quite successful. Despite the disputes and legal battles, saccharin gained popularity as a sugar substitute, especially during times of sugar shortages, such as during World War I and II. So why are we so clinging to sugar? 
And when you eat sugary foods, especially those high in refined sugars, your brain responds by releasing dopamine, which leads to feeling of pleasure and reward. This is part of the brain's natural response to pleasure stimuli, including food that help reinforce behavior necessary for survival. The release of dopamine in response to sugar consumption is similar to how the brain responds to other pleasurable activities, such as engaging in enjoyable hobbies or experiencing positive social interactions. Over time, repeated consumption of sugary foods and associated dopamine release can lead to a reinforcing cycle where the brain starts to associate sugary foods with pleasure and reward. And this connection between sugar and dopamine release is thought to play a role in developing cravings and potential overconsumption of sugary foods. Is one of the reasons why some people find it difficult to resist sugary treats and may experience cravings for them. Historically, sugar was a valuable and luxurious commodity because sugar refinery technology was limited in the pre-industrial age. It was highly sought after by the wealthy and the nobility. It was often seen as a symbol of wealth, status, and power. Queen Elizabeth I of England's fondness for sugar was reflected in her own personal consumption. It is said that she also used a toothpaste made of sugar to maintain her teeth and improve her oral hygiene. Now, this historical practice is an example of how sugar was utilized for purposes beyond just consumption. But we all now know that the high health cost of sugar pressure in the forms of metabolic and cardiovascular diseases. So what Thalberg discovered not only satisfied the craving for sugar, but also eliminated many of the obvious downsides of sugar. And it was a lot cheaper than sugar as well. It is estimated that one kilogram of saccharin is as sweet as half a ton of sugar. If you are a food manufacturer, that's one fiftieth of the cost to produce the same sweetness. Wouldn't you also want to popularize it? But saccharin also has its limitations. It is known for having a bitter or metallic aftertaste, especially when used in high concentrations or when compared to the taste of natural sugar. This aftertaste is one of the reasons why saccharin is often used in combination with other sweeteners or flavor enhancers to mitigate its bitter notes and provide a more balanced and pleasant taste in food and beverages. In 1937, Michael Sveder was a graduate student working in the laboratory of Professor Kyle Folkers at the University of Illinois. Sveder was tasked with synthesizing new compounds as part of his research, and one day he happened to get a substance on his fingers while working. Without thinking much of it, he absentmindedly licked his fingers to clean them. And just like Thalberg, Sveder didn't wear gloves and wash his hands. Not so much about lab safety, right? What's up with all these chemists or synthetic chemists back in the days? To his surprise, Sveder noticed an intensely sweet taste. He immediately recognized that the substance he had came into contact with was responsible for the sweetness. He investigated further and identified the compound as cyclamate. Sveder's accidental taste test led to the discovery of cyclamate's sweetening properties. He informed his colleagues, including Professor Folker, about his findings. The news quickly spread, and cyclamate's potential as a sugar substitute and artificial sweetener caught the attention of the food industry. Cyclamate's discovery was particularly significant during a time when the search for low-calorie sweeteners was gaining momentum. The first publication on cyclamate's sweet taste and potential applications appeared in a scientific journal in 1939. The compound's sweetening power, which was about 30 to 50 times greater than that of sucrose or table sugar, 
it an attractive option for reducing caloric content in foods and beverages. Although cyclamate is not as sweet as saccharin, it is often considered to have a clean, sweet taste with little to no bitterness or aftertaste. Cyclamate was once widely used as a sugar substitute, particularly in combination with saccharin, to balance out the taste and mask any aftertaste. The combined use of cyclamate and saccharin was so popular at one point that you could virtually find it in every sweet food and beverages. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. In 1969, a bombshell news appeared in the New York Times. The FDA ordered a total cyclamate ban. In the 1960s, some studies in rats suggested a potential link between high doses of cyclamate and bladder tumors. Now, these findings raised concerns about the safety of cyclamate as a food additive. As a result of these concerns, cyclamate was banned as a food and beverages additive in the United States by the US FDA in 1969. Many other countries also imposed restrictions or bans on cyclamate. But because cyclamate and saccharin always appeared together on product labels, many people unknowingly assumed they were similar sweeteners, and they also believed that saccharin could cause cancer, so sweeteners were bad. Now, in fact, there is no evidence showing saccharin alone could cause cancer after days of extensive research. Now, with all the dramas surrounding sweeteners, the food industry had the highest financial stake in it. Among all, Coca-Cola and Pepsi were the two that were most sensitive to sweetener health concerns because both companies started producing zero-calorie cola products in the 1960s, and they were so popular among fans. Now, with the ban on cyclamate, both companies were in urgent need to look for a new sweetener that could be mixed with saccharin to manufacture a new generation of zero-calorie cola. This was when aspartame made its debut in the world. In 1965, a chemist named James Schalachter worked for the pharmaceutical company G.D. Searle and Company. Schalachter was working on developing a new anti-ulcer medication when he synthesized some white powder, which he accidentally tasted again. He noticed that it had an intensely sweet taste. It was later named aspartame. Recognizing the sweetening potential of aspartame, further research and development followed. It was found to be approximately 200 times sweeter than table sugar on a weight-to-weight -weight basis. G.D. Sherrill submitted a petition for aspartame's approval to the U.S. FDA in the 1970s. The FDA initially approved aspartame for use in dry foods in 1981, but approval for use in beverages was delayed due to concerns about its safety. These concerns were mainly related to early studies that suggested potential links to brain tumors and other health issues in animals. As a result, aspartame faced significant regulatory hurdles and controversies. After extensive reviews and studies, aspartame was eventually approved for the use in beverages in 1983. The FDA concluded that there was no evidence to support the earlier concerns and that aspartame was safe for consumption within established regulatory limits. Aspartame became an increasingly popular sugar substitute in a variety of products. The commercialization of aspartame was marked by collaboration between G.D. Sherrill and the food and beverages industry. The artificial sweetener was marketed under various brand names, including NutraSweet and Equal. It quickly gained popularity as a low-calorie sugar substitute, especially in diet soft drinks and other low-calorie or sugar-free products. 
like cyclamate, some scientists were still concerned about aspartame's health risk. Of all, Dr. John W. O'Neill, a neuroscientist, is known for his research into the potential effects of aspartame consumption on brain health. Dr. O'Neill's involvement with aspartame began in the early 1970s. He conducted experiments that suggested a link between high levels of aspartame consumption and brain lesion in laboratory animals, specifically in the hypothalamus, a brain region involved in various physiological function. A study from 2020 in mice and rats. Reanalyzed research from Italy's Ramazzini Institute and found that aspartame caused leukemia and lymphoma in the animals. Now we have to understand that any small increase in cancer risk is not only a personal health burden but also a burden to the families and the entire medical system and healthcare spending. But scientists do point out that humans are not rats or mice. What is observed in animal may or may not be true in humans. Now this is where the problem is. Now when we study an experimental drug in animals before marketing, if it is cancerous, the experiment would often stop and go back to the drawing board. But with a sweetener like. Aspartame, which has been used in food and beverages for decades, it is also impossible to go back to do any newer testing in humans, and there's no way to do trials to see if it could cause cancer in humans, knowing it could cause cancer in animals. Now, the only thing we could do is rely on observational data to see if aspartame is associated with an increased risk of cancer or not. But we all know that observational association studies will never give us the golden answer. Another sensitive matter is that sweeteners like aspartame involve too many stakeholders these days. The entire food and beverages industry employs so many people that any health risk associated with sweetener could cost tens of thousands of people's job. And may potentially shake the economy. I believe that after these three years, we have all seen how science can be written in favor of stakeholders. So I wouldn't be surprised to see how findings may be downplayed. More recently, in 2022, a study published in PNAS showed that the anxiety-inducing effect of aspartame in mice. Could pass down to up to two following generations. So even though aspartame may have an unconfirmed cancer risk, its other health implication is still a very gray area. In conclusion, aspartame is also considered to be safe for both the pregnant woman and the developing infant by the FDA and the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Nutrition. And yet, a 2022 study found that pregnant rats fed with aspartame gave birth to pups with altered gut microbial communities, higher fat percentages, and increased risk of obesity. Now we now face many increasing health challenges, such as early onset cancers before age 50, obesity, mental health challenges, and cardiovascular diseases. And along with that, our lifestyle and choice of food have drastically changed in the past 100 years. Now one could argue that we have better diagnosis these days, leading to more disease awareness and recognition. But Is that the only explanation, or are there hidden truths that are waiting to be uncovered? Well, I'm Dr. Han. Together, we will learn to live a healthier life. So, eat healthily and stay healthy. Take care. Bye.